This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. podcast. Individuals are quick to point out the deficiencies in any system. Watching from a distance and playing Monday morning quarterback. Often waiting for someone to step up and make a change. When it's time to put the complaints to bed and step into action, a rare individual attempts to make a system better, ultimately trying to fill some of the gaps that are evident, to be a person of action and not just words. Proactivity is a gift that is not given to all taking the reins of a project in order to make a better world for those around them, to hear the cries of it being cold and be the one to provide a blanket. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome Jose Medina to talk about the suffering of SWAT. Jose found a need and filled the gap. So, Jose, thank you so much. We've been trying to get you in here for quite some time. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, thank he, you for having me. He, he canceled, we canceled, he canceled, we canceled. Yeah. Break up, get together, break yeah. up. It's like a high school, it was like a high school romance. <laughs> Stop it. Mike, finally somebody with a vowel at the end of their name that I can pronounce. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Very easy. It flows off the tongue. But uh, listen, brother, I, we, we've we talked about you. Mike has told me all about you. First listen, time I, I've ever I, met you face I, I got to I gotta say, I am honored to have him in here. I mean, one of the, you know, the, the best things that they got, could say about a cop is, you know, he's squared away. This guy's squared away. When I first trained with him, he's the, ty- he's the type of cop that you want to be just like. I wouldn't use him as the poster child for your training. <laughs> You might want to pick a different pet or a different post. And listen, job. I may be an idiot in here, but I was a pretty good cop back in the day. Andrew. <laughs> is, is he hour up yet? Where's the, where's the coffee truck? Oh, I don't care about the barricade suspect. Don't worry about it. I was driving the coffee truck. They didn't want me anywhere near the scene. So the funny thing is, is I don't even know where you were on. If you want to say your department. Yeah. Piscataway Police. Piscataway Township. Middlesex so, County. Yeah. So you got all the f- overflow from Rutgers. Oh, Rutgers. City of Plainfield, City of New Brunswick, all the games, all the crazies, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you guys are busy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Black so, hole, we call it. <laughs> well, so every, well, you know what, before we get into the social media question, let's get a big shout out to our marquee sponsor, that's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody, but we do trust them. So if you're looking for a car, go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. Jose, each week we take a question from our audience. This week's social media question comes from Stephen B. It's, what's the difference between constructive criticism and Monday morning quarterbacking? This, is a, this, was, a quest, this was a question that was very near and dear to my heart because in my department there was a ton of Monday morning quarterbacks, and I hated it. There was a couple guys who did co- some constructive criticism, and I, I was trying to wrap my head around what the difference is. But if you were posed that question, being in the field that you are right now, what do you think you'd answer? Constructive criticism would be, I, it's the pros of things you did efficient compared to the things that need improvement. Uh, and then that's my constructive criticism, giving my professional opinion of what, what you did good, because you always start with what went well, what, what you did good, and what we could fix. And then, obviously, Monday morning quarterback is usually, in my opinion, is the person that uh, has never been there before. It's a good point. It's a good point, Mike. What do you a, that's exactly what I was going to say. Constructive criticism is, criticism is someone who knows. And like you said, you're going to say, okay, this this went well. What can we improve on this? And Monday morning quarterbacking is probably from the guys upstairs, like we were saying before, that did a year on the street and say, why is the kid doing yeah. this? Why is the kid doing that? Yeah. When they've never done it, they've never seen, they've never been in a situation like that. I think a lot of it has to do with intent. You know, if I'm if I'm giving you constructive criticism, I'm I'm trying to make I'm telling you these things because I'm trying to make you better. Monday morning quarterback, I think it's a it's an for a lot of these people who do it, and most I'm I'm going to generalize here and say a lot of it is comes from bosses. It's it's demeaning. It's yeah. it's not made to feel you to for you to feel good about. Yeah. You know, unless you did something entirely egregious. But most of the time, it's made to chop down your ego a little bit. Let's say you had a good job on the street. Well, somebody's going to come in there, and they're not going to say one good thing about that job that you did, but they're going to tell you 10 things that you did wrong, right. even right. though the job turned out good. Yeah. But you, you, you said it before. Cops are like crabs on a barrel. Once one tries to get up, you know, they, they grab and pull them back down. Yes, so you get, a lot of that, you get a lot of that Monday morning quarterbacking from people who are in your position. Yep. You know, yep. well, why, why do you do it this way? Why do you, if I was, if I was there, I would have done it this way. Shut your fucking mouth. You weren't there. Yeah. Uh, when I got promoted, uh, I went to a great, um, 
leadership school. And it was a major from the state police who knew my brother. He was a retired trooper. So we had that bond. And one of the best things he ever did when he was talking about, he talked about constructive criticism and, and evaluation of your people. And, and he goes, the first and foremost thing is when you go out there as the supervisor and you, you're about to, you know, give somebody constructive criticism. You don't want to unload on them, but you want to give them that professional thing. Make sure you as a supervisor, make sure that you know what you're about to say, that you, what you're about to criticize them on, give the, the expertise that you know from experience. But if you made a mistake, even if you have experience, if you made the mistake, he goes like this. He pats himself on the back. And, and all of a sudden, like, the kid behind me, new, new young kid, Sarge, he's like, uh, you compliment yourself? Yeah. And we all look back at it. We're like, uh, he's like, no. He's like, you own it. You own your criticism for yourself before you can go after anybody else. So if you haven't been there before, like, and, this, and, and that, that resonated with me when he said that. I'm like... That's my speed, right? You know, there. Con- constructive criticism could come from your own mistakes, also. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. You know, it's you yeah. Go, it's you an after action something. report. Yeah. 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 You say, you know, hey, listen, I was in that spot too. You know, yeah. here's what I did wrong. Here's what I think you may be able to improve on. Yeah. You know, so I think that was a good question for you. Thank you very much, Steve, for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions. We will try to get them on the air. So I, I've done my best to read as much as I can about you, but. As much of the stuff online that you post, you're still there's some, there's an air of mystery around you. There was <laughs> that, that Medina mystique. Yeah. There, there is. There's an yeah. air like you know enough, yeah. but you don't know a whole lot. Right. So where'd you grow up? I grew up in uh, here in New Jersey, a uh, borough of Cotteret in the Chrome section, little projects. That's where I grew up. The projects. Yeah. I didn't know Cotteret had projects. They had little projects, and it's still it was, like, was it like three projects? Yeah, uh, it's. <laughs> Well, the county and DEA still have cameras out there, so <laughs> <laughs> my my uncle, my you uncle, know you was, made it when there's a shot spot right out there. Oh my, yeah, <laughs> my uncle was the mayor of Carter for a while. Oh yeah, who was yeah. Jim Felice. He just, okay. he just okay. passed away a couple years okay. ago. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my his son is a cop in Carter right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have family parties out there by the waterfront where uh, uh, the shootings just happen and stuff. And you now we, we smoke cigars. Like, oh look, the ca- never, DA's there with the camera. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is I've, I've been to Carter at. And Carteret seems like a pretty nice, well-to-do area. Right. I, I, I guess I've never been to the projects. So. Yeah, like you, if you just drive and go from Roosevelt Avenue into Chrome, and and like nighttime years ago, the cops, the uh, cops wouldn't even go down there. <laughs> like they wouldn't, literally wouldn't go down there. They Let the police they, themselves. They would ride the, the Roosevelt <laughs> Avenue border and on in one side, the West Carteret side, and everything else good. And they, and we'd be like, oh, these guys want to come down here, you know. And as you grow older, you come visit family, you know. You know, and everyone stayed the same. They did their crazy stuff. But, you know, we moved out and we went back to visit. We didn't care. We don't judge. But, you know, you hear about this and that and the shootings and stuff. But it's like me, Piscataway, on the border, we had the flats. It's right on the border of Plainfield. But our side, you know, shootings all the time, you know. It's and just, Carteret's got rollway on the one side too, right? Yeah, yeah. So... It's a, well, you know, you don't you don't realize it, but see, in New Jersey, it's different than the rest of the world. You've traveled all over the world, yeah. And you go into certain parts of this country, it's like you turn right, and you are in the worst ghetto you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. From the nicest neighborhood yep. that you've ever been in. <laughs> in New Jersey, there's usually, and I tell people this all the time about New Jersey, there you you start seeing it. Yeah. It's, it's it. about a one block buffer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Listen, you drive down 280 and you'll start seeing when you get into the bad areas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. So that's it. So, you know, you grew up regular, uh, getting any trouble when you grew up? Most cops uh, did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we grew up, our house, my father, God rest his soul, he had a house, the first brand new house built in Chrome. Like it was a customized house, little by level. Um, you know, I came from Puerto Rico, sixth grade education, but another yeah. Puerto Rican body. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. And another body. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dale. Drew. Dale. This is like the fifth one we had in here. Hey. No, I'm only kidding you. I'm only kidding. <laughs> he's he's my brother from another yeah. island. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bucardi, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So you know, we had a house built there, and we were on a corner, and everyone was, you know, families well tight. And then um, you said your father came here with a sixth grade education. Yeah, from Puerto Rico, he had like a bunch of brothers and sisters. A couple were were killed in the homicides and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, lived in a small shack in Puerto Rico. Um, and my, so you grew up in an area in in an era when Puerto Ricans were not viewed very fondly in this country. No, yeah. I don't know how old yeah. you are. It's hard to tell. Yeah, fifty five. So. You're fifty five, and and still the oldest one in here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You? 
<laughs> the only one we've seven. Had, the only one we've had older in here. We had a World War II vet who was at D Day in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, and I went to high school with him. He yes. was a senior when I was a freshman, <laughs> yeah, so he was only like a year older than him. But yeah. so, what was that like? Did you did you feel it? Because your father came, he was yeah. first generation. And we were, did you feel it? Um, I yeah. As a small kid, I could sense it, like you know. But my parents did a great job of kind of like trying to shell us from it, mm-hmm. you know. But there were times where, like. When the cops came, like one of the supermarkets, my brother got accused of stealing gum, right? And and like the cop showed up and wham, like they were like the people in the store. He did it, yeah, Spanish and this and that. And, yeah. and my father, you know, from from old school, pow, pow, like very, you know, again he he didn't know he was hands on and pow, you know, la plancha the whole nine. And uh, my brother was, you know. We were, we were mostly beat up for a little bit, you know, because, you know, we just didn't understand, but we saw cousins going through with the, the whole stereotype and stuff like that. And, but, you know, as you grow older, you started seeing it, but we still were kind of shelled from the family because it was like, they were like, you know, this is why they're doing this. this was, it a, was it a Puerto Rican neighborhood? Oh yeah. 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 Well, the cool thing about Puerto Ricans, we just had a, a friend of mine in who was Puerto Rican from when I was a little kid. And the cool thing about Puerto Ricans now is, is... And, and our generation gets to see it. You always hear about how when the Italian immigrants came in or the Irish immigrants came in, they weren't looked at very fondly. And then the second and third generation, that sort yeah. of bled out. Well, that's ha- that's happening with the Puerto Ricans now. Yeah. And I think it's wonderful because they've assimilated into they've assimilated into yeah. American society. Oh, and yeah. they're just they're like everybody else now. Every other first or second oh, yeah. generation person. Yeah, so I mean, it, cool. can even, and even that like is a good point because my dad, my dad and mom, I got, I got to say, and our family name from the Medinas and Rosados, like as we were like the staple of the town, of that area, you know? And there was a lot of blacks and Hispanics, right? But everyone knew us. So they knew the name, like, oh, Medina, oh. So like, it was kind of like, like the Italians, yeah. like you yeah. knew, don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't touch, like- no toca, or, <laughs> or she's going to go real, you know? So, so, but um, yeah, and then eventually our parents got us out of it, especially the big ride that took place, a big fight from like the Woolbridge crew versus Carteret. There was a big like, thing at the park and next you know shots fired hundreds of cops came mutual aid and that's when my mom was like it's time to get out of here and we want to just moving out of Cotteret into Woolbridge Township just across the way you know Woolbridge came in fought our guys <laughs> yeah. Woolbridge lost so we went to the, to the, the losing, losing side the losing side yeah, okay. <laughs> so as you, as you grow up through high school it was, did the trouble stop did you start straightening out like yeah, I mean, yeah, I was I was good for a little bit, but um, you know, my parents were going through a marital problem, you know, um, and it was bad, and um, I was a young kid, I was about like eight, and um, yeah, you know, my mom and dad were just like he was he was jealous of her, and one night he, I still remember it, you know, I tell the story, I was like, you know, one night he was waiting for my mom, and he just I, he asked me a question, I was in the bathroom, and and he unleashed hell on me, he took his frustrations out on me, and I was beat down pretty good. Um, and then, uh, locked myself in the room, you know, I was all beat up and he's crying after he beat the crap out of me. And, uh, my mom, my mom said that was it. And then, you know, they called for the divorce and he moved out. But, you know, um, for me, I, I just knew he was hurting, you know what I mean? And yeah. I forgave him as a young kid. Like I didn't understand, like, you know, like a dog, you know, go, oh, I'm so sorry, dad. Um, what did I do to, what did yeah. I do? I'm yeah. sorry I did whatever I did. Right. Sorry, I'm sorry I did what yeah. I did. Yeah, and, and honestly, like, years of 2010, when he, right before he died of cancer, like, I was with him, I, I was out on work, out of work on injury. I was with him in the hospitals because he had cancer, and, and I was at the house with him, hospice, we talked. And the one thing he said to me, he, he, at his place, he said, I just want you to know, you know, can you, I just want you to f- forgive me for what I did back, and he, he brought it up. I'm like, Dad, I forgave you after it happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's you know you. you I mean that that put him at peace anyway. Oh yeah. yeah. You remember yeah. when you your parents used to spank you or something, and they would tell you that line. Yo, I this don't. is this is gonna hurt you, hurt me more than it hurts yeah. you. Yeah. There is some truth to that, but there are some sick, sadistic parents who should never be parents. Yeah. But we do have to understand that parents. Especially, are you the firstborn? No, I'm the, the, the youngest out of three. Yeah. They don't, like, there's no manual for, especially yeah. back then, there's no manual for how to raise a child. They don't know. Yeah. And they're human beings. We sometimes forget that parents, I know my kids forget the, my, their parents are human beings sometimes. We have feelings. We get hurt just like everybody else. And unfortunate things happen like yep. that. Yeah. So you forgave them. But, you know, growing up where you did, how did that lead you into law enforcement? 
Was, so, that, was that just by chance or were you actively pursuing it? Uh, no, it, it, by, by chance, by watching the show SWAT. Ironically, <laughs> when SWAT came out, I was a little kid and, and between that and Batman and Robin, you know, like, oh, I watch that stuff. Fighting crime. But it was like I saw SWAT, you know, and I started watching it. And I loved the music. And then I remember one day at my grandma's house, my father had the old uh, Chevy. You know, when you pawn the brake, the car would move, you know. So I'm in, I'm in the parking lot in, in her apartment. And all of a sudden, I pull the brake thinking, like, I'm a police officer. And the car starts rolling down. Thank God it was a baseball field next to it. And I'm rolling. My father jumps off the second floor of the porch. And he starts chasing me. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to get him, you know. So what are you doing? I, I was playing SWAT, Dad. You know, I was, you know. And then that's when it formed. It was like... Um, so I always tell people the story, like I wanted, I want, that was my moment. And then I said, I want to be a either actor playing SWAT or a real SWAT guy. And obviously I didn't, I sucked at acting. So, <laughs> so I said, you know, this was my gig and that's. So you got into police work like that and that never left you? No. Once the reality of police work hits, cause when the reality of police work hits, yeah. it usually changes your mind a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, cause what happened, like I was on my own at 17. I lived at a small apartment. My, you know, my parents sold the house, you know, when they divorced and, um, I didn't want to, I wanted to finish high school at the school I was in. So the neighbor down the street, let me stay there. I was working after school or to work at the, at the, uh, the mall, the ice cream place and practice football after school, go to work, this and that. And I just paid my small little rent, this and that. And, um, so eventually I was getting pushed to go to college and I'm like, you know, my brother was a big party at the time when the house was about to be sold. You know, my sister, my, my family was chaos being split. I'm like, let me join the Marines, you know, so in 87, I joined the Marines. So let me get discipline, you know. Oh, how long were you in for? A few years and it was a short, short oh, stint and then out, you yeah, know. Did you hit the Gulf War? Just before. Oh, yeah, just before. Right. Yeah. Is that, yeah, that's when I would have went in. Yeah, I just needed to find some structure because I knew if I tried to get into college, I was like, I'm gonna wind up raping, pillaging, doing <laughs> some, some. Really, I was just gonna do some stupid and hitting, hitting a teacher. Yeah, and um, <laughs> so once I got out, you know, of course, you know, dating all this nonsense stuff like that as a young guy, and um, but then the pursuit started. You know, I um, I started looking at the civil service thing and started dating my. My now wife at the time, my, my wife Cheryl, uh, her father was a cop. My brother, my, I was in the Marines. My brother was just became a trooper. So as I was finishing boot camp, he, he was already a trooper on a job. So that even sparked me, you know, because he didn't want that. He didn't want to be a trooper. Like he was kind of like, oh, he got his girlfriend. It's amazing growing up. The guys who don't want to become cops yeah. become cops before it, you. It, it took me twelve. <laughs> yeah. It took me twelve years. I took my first police test at eighteen. Yeah. I turned thirty yeah. in the academy. Yeah. yeah, my brother was the guy who wanted to become a cop. Took every police test, you know, started in corrections, figuring that was an easy route in there. And I take, I took one test, I took one test, and he, I remember that he was so mad, like he was so mad at me for doing that. <laughs> really? I was like, well, what do you want me to do? You want yeah. me to turn it down? It was a chief's test. Yeah. It's, it's who you know. Right. That's what it was. Would you take civil service or was your? Test I took. Service? I took like everything, and then before I got Piscataway, um, because my brother he was he was he was dating his girlfriend, got her pregnant, and then, uh, you know, his, his job closed up, so he just they were, That's why at the time when state police were in the eighties, they were looking for more minorities. Mm. So well, we fast tracked it on, got in. I'm like this son of a bitch, <laughs> you know, and then um. When I started dating my girlfriend, now a wife, um, I started taking civil service, a bunch of tests. Um, then I took Piscataway's test because uh, my wife worked for um, Atlantic Bank over in Edison. That's where Trump used to go all the time. So uh, her girlfriend and the husband was a sergeant for Piscataway. So ironically, we wound up playing uh, like a touch football game at a picnic for the company. And, and the husband, he was a sergeant, and he goes, oh, yeah, and he's, you know, give me your information. So we're playing. I throw, like, a bomb to him. He catches a touchdown, but he blows his knee out. Like, he tears his ligament in his knee. But he, we win. It's a great job interview. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. I was like, oh, no. Kid, like, you got the job. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, I didn't think nothing of it. I'm like, oh, this guy's not never going to give me the chance. And so he was in charge of training. So I got the letter from uh, Middlesex County Corrections. So my father-in-law, another one, got arrested. So Woolbridge guy, he's like, just get in the pension. Like, yeah. Just get it and learn something. Just So I, I took it. I, I'm just going to take it. And as I took it, all of a sudden I got this packet in the mail from Piscataway. The guy remembered me. He says, make sure you put this in, submit it. So I took the test for the Chiefs, aced the whole thing. But, you know, it's a Chiefs test, so I'm like, I don't know how I was going to get in. So now I'm in corrections. So I go on afternoon shift, and I'm seeing all the SOG guys, like the Red Patch guys, you know, and like, hey, how you doing? My name's Jose. Nice to meet you. 
So like they were like, listen, dude, if you ever want to join the SOG team, you know, because I was much bigger and yeah. stuff like that, like whatever. So uh, the lieutenant at the time, he was a sergeant, um, afternoon shift. He goes, hey, if you want to do some sparring at the, the, the team trailer up by the county, Middlesex County, let's do it. Support for the Suffering Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. The products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Inside the package, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0, Weed Whacker, Ear, Nose, Hair Trimmer, and the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. And we also got the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. <laughs> this, is a, this thing is a life changer. Along with that, boxer briefs. I'm gonna tell you what, these are, these are like high quality boxer briefs, and I'm, this is no joke. I'm not saying this just because their manscape sent it to us. These are nice. My boys are gonna be quite happy in there. You can't tell Kevin's wearing them under the table right now. <laughs> and we also have a nice travel package. Join over 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer just for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code TSP at manscaped.com. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of balls. Let's do it. So that became like, you know, that's what we see guys now. Like, you know, jujitsu, all this stuff is so big. Like, we, we were doing that in the 90s. We were beating the shit out of each other in the trailers with red man suit, rolling on mats. This guy, Bobby Teeple, he looked like Dick Buckus. So he was like a monster. And he's like belly to back suplexing me all over the place. But we were like learning and I was just enjoying it. And then, so I'm like, okay, I'm like de facto getting on this team and I'm like enjoying this job. And, and then my uh, come 1996, the major storm of 1996, I get this. My son is born January 1st, and I get the letter from Piscataway. Because what happened was my father-in-law and his brother, who was a chief of Rahway, and his other brother, who was like a sergeant major from the state police, whatever, um, they knew the chief from Piscataway and you know, made the call. And, and he was like, listen, you know, we're going to hook you up, this and that. I'm like, oh, my God. So I remember telling my father-in-law, I said, listen, I'm not going to let you down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shine, you know, and he goes, I, I don't want to expect anything less. And then I took for my 30 days at the jail and went to the academy and I just, full Monty, man, I was on a mission. It's funny you said that storm in 96. My swearing in with the sheriff's department got pushed off for a couple of days because of that storm. Yeah. <laughs> they shut down like the whole, it was the first yeah. week of January. Now, when you, when you took that job, did, was it what you expected? The, 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 the police job. Yeah, you, know, you had you had been watching SWAT yeah. for so long. Was it what you? It was what you expected. It, it was because I was received faster than more most guys now. See, that's odd. Yeah. That's odd to me, especially with your hook. Yeah, you know, you you have guys that break their break their ass getting in, right? And then somebody comes in with a hook like that. Yeah, in Chiefs towns, because I, I was a Chiefs town, they're always looked at funnier yeah you, well, know, you, you gotta prove yourself yeah, yeah you do you gotta yeah. prove you yourself do. because you know you know you're not just yeah. you know joe blow's son-in-law that just got the job yeah. right i mean you you were a chief's town as well right yeah yeah so i mean everybody's got a hook in the chief yeah. especially back then yeah and, and you're right because like when i was an instructor at the academy I, you saw a lot of that right like watching certain people and that's why i said to my father-in-law and even chief larock at the time i'm not gonna let you down hmm. and and i went into the academy and I smoked everything. Like I, yeah. I won top overall recruit. Oh, you, so, were, so you were one of those guys. I was. Oh, you uh, yeah, motherfucker! That's right. I didn't care. I, and like, and people were whining, complain, and I'm like, and they made. This is the best part. My son was colicky. I was you know, my wife. I was trying to help her out. And I sucked at it, and um, so they wanted to make. I was trying to be just a, a guy in the academy, and then I became a squad leader. So okay, that's good enough. You know, military, whatever. Then I'm surprised I, they didn't make you XO or C. Well, they made, then they made, we had like, it was like almost 60 people. So we had two platoons. Then they made me a platoon leader. And then they started firing a bunch of people. And I'm like, I go home, tell my wife, I hope they don't make me class leader. I don't want to make, be the guy. And she's like, why? I'm like, I just, you know, with Joey and then the kid, and I just don't want this nonsense. Like, I did it in Corrections Academy. Like, you know, I got humbled there. Like, I did good, but I, I messed up on firearms. They, like, my handgun, like, I, I was great with a rifle, but I, I was one of those guys that sucked with the handgun, and and that's that was my humble moment for firearms. I was like, I'm never, I'm going to learn from this. Yeah, I'm never right? going to do that again. So then, you know, I, I'm going through this academy, and they bring me in, and they're like, the big chambers, like, we want to make you class leader. And I'm like, well, sir, is that a choice? What do you mean? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, like, 
well, you know, I have a kid who's colicky at home, and and I, I'd rather see somebody else like a you're gonna disgrace the academy. And they're yelling at me, and I'm sitting there, and the next thing you know, they're calling the chief. And, you know, they're playing a game, and the chief gets on the phone. Hey, you know, good old Italian guy. Hey, Jose, come on, just do what you got to do. You know, they want to make it. You should be proud of that. You rep- represent for Scott. Like, oh, okay, chief, no problem. All right, I'll be class later. And then, <laughs> then they say, um, so now you got to pick a, two platoon leaders. I'm like, fuck, sorry. Um, Harry Sheeman, this guy, good Harry, great guy. And a former military army guy for the sheriffs. I'm like, I'm going to make him. And then I, I see the, my riding partner, Connie, who worked with my department. Girl was like nervous as hell. She was a dispatcher. But she was nervous as hell the entire academy. So I said, I'm going to make her. And my mindset was, okay, between me, Harry, this person with no experience, we're going to show the them that we can make somebody yeah. a leader. They yell at me. Get somebody else. I'm like, sir, if you want me to take this position, we'll throw you out. I was like, I'm standing my ground. I said, we want to make her. Has had, what, what good is it putting a bunch of military folk up here all across the board and not giving somebody a chance? And They may, they may surprise you. And that's how you find yeah. the diamonds in the rough. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you see yeah. potential in someone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now you, gotta, you mold them into a leader. There yeah. was something in her that you saw yeah, yeah. that you were able to identify. It's like, yeah, I want that. Whether it's whatever yeah. it is, it's loyalty, ability, whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was one of the few non-military. I was, a, I was a squad leader. I was one of the few non-military guys. And as a squad leader, it, I had so much fun as a squad leader. Because you like you got to follow the drill to do inspections and stuff like this. And what I always used to do is when I got in front of somebody, we weren't allowed to laugh. My drill was a force recon marine, so serious. <laughs> so I would stand behind him, and my stomach was always upset. It's, my stomach's still upset all the time. I would fart. <laughs> and I, they'd have to stand there at attention and smell my ass. <laughs> <laughs> And not laugh. Right. And not laugh. And that was the hard part. But I had so much fun in the academy because of stuff like that. Well, you think yeah. you had it hard. Yeah. I was a squad leader. I had Nicky Burke on my squad. Yeah, you poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. Hobo, <laughs> Hoboken guy. Oh, yeah. He was, oh, yeah. Was I can't imagine of, what that Out of his fucking yeah, mind. I mean, you can't understand what they say, first of all. You yeah. got to get a translator in there. That Hudson County, all of like, oh. So when you got out of the academy, doing so well in the academy, did it give you a little bit of credibility or you were still, yeah. you were- I, I, Dog I, shit at that point. No, I, I, I sensed it. Like, and I knew I was going to come in because of my, you know, my brother telling me the, the inside scoop and my father in law, like, you know, plus being in the jail, like, you heard the whole rookie thing. So I was ready, you know, Teflon to it. So I, my mantra to myself was, I'm going to learn with my ears, not with my mouth. That's the word that I always hated was rookie. Yeah. I yeah. fucking hated that yeah. word because. You might as well, it was it was like a it was like a racial slur to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a new officer. I don't know what I don't know. Right. But my drill told us this. He goes, "You'll get out and you won't have the experience that these guys have, but you'll have better book smarts than them, yeah. and you can learn yeah. the experience. Yeah. They have to go back and relearn the book smarts, which they're probably not going to do. Right. So you have that advantage over them. Don't ever let anybody call you a rookie. Yeah. And that was instilled into us. I used to love yeah. when they say. A hey kid, I'm 30 years old. I'm not a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and yeah. So yeah, when I came in, it was like really like open arms because I just you know got gelled with a lot of really a, a lot of alphas, a lot of alpha, a lot of the, the detectives, a lot of. And we had a ERT unit. It was I always tell this is so funny. It was like emergency response team. Um, the chief brought me in, hey, and, the, and the lieutenant at the time, one of the first uh, cops in, in a shooting in Piscataway, Rich Gregory, great leader, Marine, Marine Corps veteran. Um, he goes, listen, you ever want to join a county team? You know, put a word in for you. I said, well, I just got here, sir, this and that. Well, we got the ERT. We want to get you involved, you know, perimeter guy. We want you because you have the physique and this and that, and you, you, you're representing. A bunch of guys with thick mustaches, look like porn stars. And all our training was was this, finger guns. There was no blue guns. <laughs> like, pew, pew, yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, you had the one instructor when you did the entry. He never died. Like, he's going around the room, and you're like, you're getting a beat on him. He's like, nope, wounded. You know, you missed me. You, <laughs> you know, missed. Like, yeah. I'm like, holy shit. But we did primarily a lot of, like, barricaded stuff. No entry work other than barricade, talking people out, perimeter. But then the county guys say, hey, we need some new young bloods, and so we interviewed with a guy, Rocco Mazzo, ran a county team of Middlesex, and like three of us got accepted. I'm like, so I'm waiting for a PT test. No PT test. ERT? No PT test. I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? I'm like, what is going on here? You know? 
And they're like, no, no, just come on board. And, and there was like, so, was like probably 70 dudes on that county team. And I'm like, in my mind's already like, there's just too many people here. Like, yeah. And I'm a young guy. I'm just being quiet. And, and the training was just like, it was just so dizzy. Like you're just standing around watching paint dry. It was just, it was horrible. Were you a little disappointed? Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, it's just SWAT, you know, and you know, yeah. no, eventually you're gonna get in and do these jobs, and we're then supposed, we... we're supposed to be gung ho, you know. Yeah. We're supposed to be the, the 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 people that the cops call when they need help. Right. Well, you watch you watch movies with any any movie with a SWAT team in it. They're shooting people every day. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they yeah. walk away from it. Oh yeah. They walk away from it. Commercial break. Go, commercial break. You <laughs> they, know. they go back to work the next yeah. day, which yeah. is the big funny one. That's, yeah. Oh yeah. And they're driving in the car. Oh, they go yeah. back to work right after it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Right after it. Next <laughs> yeah. day. Load their yeah. guns up. You know, clean everything up. They go back to work. Yeah. I yeah. was. I was just like mystified. Like, what the hell is going on? So you know, I was there for a little bit. Then I was at ERT, and then eventually ERT got disbanded. New new uh, business administrator came in, squashed it. That was it. So I was oh, stay on the county team. We did a couple, started doing a couple entry jobs. Okay, no big deal. But there's still no standards. And I, I know I, I was I was like expecting PT and shooting yeah. drills. And you want to be the cream of the crop. You yeah. want to be the best of the best. And called on when when right. the, the average street guy can't handle. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I said. That's you know SWAT is the people. When people need help, they call the police. When police need help, they call squat. Right. Uh, squat. Right. Squat. They call SWAT. SWAT. You're supposed to be the one that is far yeah. more. You know. More yeah. advanced. Yeah. yeah. So did it, how long, how long were you there? Did you stay on that the rest of your career? So I was on county team, probably like three occasions. I'd go, break up with them, come back. And then uh, a couple months after Columbine, 99, the new chief brought me in. And uh, he said, we want to, I want to form a response team. That's how our full team was formed. I was like, well, so how do you want to do this? He was like, just get, let's get, let's get as many as it, enough people the best team, the best training, and he goes, you know, I said, what's my limitations? He goes, obviously, it's not going to be full-time. That, I, that's something I want to get, the autonomy. If if a chief comes in there and says, I want you to develop this team, right? usually the next sentence is, but I want this person on it and this person right. on it and this person. Yeah, he didn't do that. He yeah. was like, he goes, I just want the best team for this because because we want to get it. We want to be the first on the East Coast to do something. And I got to say, we... To this day, I can brag that our, our department is one of the first in the East Coast, and I'll explain, to put a lot of heavy standards in place. So I, That was Columbine. was like 97. That's really yeah, early on in your yeah, career. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, big time. It was like he wanted, because he knew I was into this with the county, so I brought my other partner, Artie, Artie Randolph, yeah, yeah. Um, and then a guy, Anthony Chris Foley, and we put our minds together. This is what we're going to do. And I started calling on the hard lines because we didn't have cell phones. I'd call L.A. County Sheriff, L.A. SWAT. Reps and say, hey, you know, Piscataway, we we're trying to put a local team together. Can you tell me what your recommendations are for a standardized team, a local team, how many hours a month? So at the time, the, the woman, she, I remember, she started sent me all the paperwork in the mail, and it was 240 hours a year for a part time team. That's what they had their standard in LA. That's a lot of time. So, it was, so basically, I calculated, you know, 10 hour, two 10 hour days a month for 12 months. I went in, wow. sold it to the chief. Plus, our shift was 10 and three quarter hour, four on, four off, 10 and three quarter hours. And then our detectives worked the four and three, 10 hours. So I'm like, this is perfect. I said, this is what I want to do. He says, let's do it. Next thing you know, we started building a roster of names. So that, that first six months of building was no like, hey, you're on the team, let's go. We had to put a process. We had to put entry level, interview. We put a testing together. PT test, and then we came up with the shooting test, and then we started doing beta tests on it to make sure all these guys and gals. And we actually had the first one of our for for Jersey, one of the first female medics, who's a also a full time cop on our team. And we would have her do ride alongs with on her days off if she wanted. She'd go ride with Camden, she'd go ride with New York, Newark. She was up in the Bronx, like she was badass, yeah. and, and she was getting like real time stuff. And she was on our team, and we had. Our 10 hour days of training twice a month, we are nine and a half hours of training. And when we mean training, <laughs> yeah, I, it was like some, some dudes and gals are like, oh my God, this guy's going to kill us. And so that, that just, I want everybody to grasp that concept. You are going to show up in Piscataway. How many, how many calls on an average year did you get for SWAT in, or in local? Uh, well, once the team started rolling, we were averaging about three to five jobs a week for like wow, wow. About that's 12, a lot 12 yeah. years straight all right three to five jobs a week see that's on the high end too 
because I'm thinking 240 hours for an average department, the SWAT will be called out maybe three, four times a month, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot of training. And I want everybody to realize how much work goes in behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. By the time the SWAT shows up on, on site, the shit has hit the fan already. Yeah, it's it's yeah. bad. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really bad. Yeah. So they have to be very sure in what they're doing at all times. Oh, yeah. When you, when you see that black truck pull up, you know the shit hit the fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the initial mission was when we started the whole team and everyone was formed on paper and the guys were starting to train. And every training day, it was a PT component. It was all physical fitness, yeah. uh, whether it's self-defense, uh, grappling, jujitsu. Everything was going down in the morning or the afternoon. But we were doing it. And then but the goal was active shooter. So the first mission of our training was we were going to schools and businesses and all we were doing with video cameras and notepads and all our guys were doing was just walking through these places, labeling stuff. It was still four-man teams back then, right? Yeah. yeah. And then it went to two and now it's yeah. single, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, we were just, our, our team members were just walking through doing analysis. So that's, we were like, okay, group one, group two, you go to this school. To, and we were just doing surveys, assessment, and then we come back. And then we started labeling the doors. And again, you're talking 99, 2000, we're labeling doors and we're doing all this stuff. State police and us, we started training together. NTOA came out. Uh, we started using some of their training models and, you know, of tactics and stuff. And we just started building on it. And then, then at, as I started teaching at the police academy on a steady basis, um, you know, you started cultivating skills from veteran guys. I was like, and I was one of those guys. I go to classes and I learn from some good people. And then I, even from the, the, the goofy instructors, I always learned something, whether- You got to pick something yeah. out that, that's going to fit you. Yeah, that's what I did. Yep. And, and, and and we were just killing it. Like we were just tearing these dudes up and, and like we were having a good time. And it was what happened in SWAT stayed there. Like, and, and the chief was loving it. And, you know, because the P, every twice a year you had to do PT standards and shooting standards. And yeah, after so about the fifth or sixth year, guys, some of the guys started getting comfortable. Like, oh, you know, Medina's getting a little crazy. There were detectives in the back and they go run into the captain. They're like, yeah, you think you can lighten up? You know, we're on the team now. No one, no one really can make the team. Very few people are making it. You know, I think we should be grandfathered in. And, you know, I had straight line to the chief. And, and I'm like, the chief's like, yeah, the captain's saying some guys are bitching. You know, I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, they're saying that uh, maybe you should give them a little uh, soft toe dance. I'm like, oh, I'll see you on the next drill. And next drill, uh, boom, yeah. knocking dudes down, man. I fought, <laughs> if, 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 they're do, if they're bitching, then good, get them off the team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I fought for years to try to, and, and the only way it'll change is if there's some sort of financial compensation. I used to try to get uh, physical fitness standards put into mm -hmm. our contract. Yeah. Because nothing to me looks worse than a guy who's just let himself go. Yeah. You know, the, the uniform's always wrinkled. It just doesn't look squared away. And you take away constructive authority when that happens. Yeah. But I, I, I came up with and I tried to sneak it into one of the contracts we were negotiating. And half the department just was so against it. And I said, you don't. it's not mandatory. It's voluntary. You it's, can't make it mandatory because if someone gets hurt or something, then your yeah. right. department gets sued for it. I wanted to make yeah. it voluntary where you got a, a small little stipend, yeah. nothing crazy. You know, it was, it, and I put together all these different standards. It was like, you know, run a mile and a half in 15 minutes, which yeah. is very easily doable. It's a 10 minute mile. That's yeah. all it is. And boy, the pushback that I got. I, I really? did the same thing. I went to the chief. I said, you know, because I got certified as a police conditioning instructor and I made up this whole program about what we could do to get guys in shape. And like you said, it's a voluntary thing. Mm -hmm. I said, how about voluntary thing? If they pass it, they get four hours in their time back. Yeah. Do it twice a year, you get eight hours. Yeah. I brought it up to a PBA meeting. The guy said, who are you to tell me to get in shape? I said, that's it. Goodbye. I took the paper, ripped it right yeah. up. I said, chief, we're not doing it. Yeah. I, I, I got to say, our place, uh, the last bunch of years before I left, we had that, and we did it, and it was going well. Like, we literally, once a year, every June, if you you volunteer, like, and it was set in stone. We did it. And it was kind of one of those things, like, the, the town didn't know about it. The chief was, and the captains were like, hey, let's do this to kind of boost morale. And in exchange, you get a full day off. Like actually, you'd get if you completed and passed the PT test, you'd get two days off. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's great. And then if you 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 didn't didn't do it and didn't pass, they'd give you one day off. Like, State police does it. So yeah. why why that's should an incentive right? Why I mean, shouldn't every department yeah. do it? You're getting better, healthier right. officers. The insurance companies should be all over that because you're getting healthier officers who right. aren't going to bleed the system. Oh yeah, and then you had this you know seven foot giant he, he pulls his hamstring and instead of just like oh he pulled his hand on a run or the 300 meter I think we had, um you know kind of 
instead of shaking it off, like he made a big issue out of it. And then he went, he played the, well, you know, I'm, I'm hurt. And we're like, like, oh, dude, like you're going to get us crushing. And then, they, you know, they were like, listen, just don't make a big deal. Of it. Go get your therapy, whatever like that. And, you know, he was just looking for like, what's well, an injured on duty type thing. And he was just put, I'm like, dude, you're, you're pushing this. And then <laughs> town knew about it. Like we're done. Yeah. So we did it for like th- three, four years. And it was, everyone loved it. People were, People were excited to go to work. Even the heavier people were like actually working out months ahead, and it just because they wanted those two days. Of course, of course. But it, it always it always happens yeah. that way. Where you know you have a lot of good things. You've had a long career. You have a lot of good things when you started, and yeah. they just constantly get taken away because of one idiot just yeah. screws yeah. it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I used to call it the doctrines, and I would name the doctrines. Yeah, that's yeah. the. And there's a listen up. To be honest, there's a lot of Donaldson doctrines, but they were mostly memo driven <laughs> stuff because yeah. I had a I had a large vocabulary, and my administration did not. So I would throw, I would wield that vocabulary like a sword, mm. pretty much to make yeah. them look stupid. It's kind of like. Hey, have something in common. <laughs> yeah. Listen, sometimes yeah. it's good to poke the bear. Yeah. It's, it's good to poke the bear because when people get higher up in those positions, they get um, they get jealous of you. They get jealous. They see your, your stock is on the rise. They mm-hmm. see you're squared away. They see you know what you're doing. And it's their job to make sure that they, you – they want to elevate you, but they don't want to get you above them because then they're right. going to push you down. It's crabs did, in a barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Did you run into that? Oh, yeah. It's it, I did everything good with the team, this and that. Taught at the academy, but when he just that example, when it came for promotion, that's where like I passed this, passed that. But then it was like one person out of the, the three ranks that squashed certain numbers just to make sure yeah. I wouldn't get it. So the one year, the one year on my evaluations, they they cracked me. I mean, they cracked me on my one evaluation. Yeah. And I know for a fact, like here's this the sad part. I know that certain administrators changed evaluations because I had the original evaluations because they yeah. were friends of mine. And they they squashed it. So, again, trying to make lemonade out of lemons, I said, okay, you're saying that I have deficiencies. I put in for 50 schools that were all free. Every single one of them was free. Here's 50 schools that I want to go to. They denied me every single one of them. I said, well, then your evaluations don't hold weight. What are you talking about? I said, if you're saying I got deficiencies, I'm putting in for training so I don't have these deficiencies anymore, but you're denying me that training. Obviously, you don't believe your evaluations too too much. So, listen, that was just my little yeah. Yeah, fuck you. you. little zing. Right. That was my little fuck you. Yeah, but that's a, that's a great point, though, because the, the, the te- teachings I would give people in the academy, young recruits leaving, and like my son who just became a cop, which the sheriffs, I would say, master your union contract, know yeah. your rules and regs and policies and procedures, because most of the rank, when they move up, 90% of them don't know it. So when you know this stuff and you know you can skirt around certain things or if something they're coming after you, well, according to this, and you read off the ramblings of the policy, past practice, this and that, where does that say? And, and you run into that. Oh, where does that say? And then pull it out. Here you go. You wrote it. Where a good, a good <laughs> leader- You signed off on it. <laughs> a good leader does exactly what you were saying. They surround themselves with the best. Right. Because ultimately, if you surround yourself with the best, not who you like, not right. who your boys with, right. if you, if you do that, you are going to shine because they're going to elevate you. They're going to make you shine, and and maybe one day one of them's going to shine right. brighter than you. And that's a great thing because yeah. you were the cause of that. Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, unlike most, I'm not threatened by by that stuff, and I know a lot of people are very threatened yeah. by somebody trying to outshine their light. You know, that's a shame. Yeah. You move through your career. Did you ever? Like th- this, this, this baby of yours that you created, did you watch it grow? Did you watch it stagnate? It grew. It grew. I mean, we were re- really, really busy after right after ground nine uh, eleven. Like I was there the night the towers went down with the rescue equipment. We we came in and then our team was there for days after. Um, right after that, really things sparked up because a lot of the government was because of what was going on. People left Patterson and they went into Piscataway to go to Rutgers. The, the Muslim Center was there and a lot of cells were actually hiding in our town. It was like a no fact. It wasn't until one night we got multiple calls of home invasions or something in apartments and come to find out it was actually the feds doing nighttime raids and n- they never told us the confliction, right? And so we show up there, guns are blazing, like what the hell's going on? Next thing you know, it's guys in plain clothes and we have feds and we're like, oh, you can't come into our town and just go kicking indoors because of you know, these towers. So that really sparked a lot of us getting involved with the federal 
uh, doing a lot of work for them. Like so, when wires and, and Intel came in, hey, you guys got to hit this place. You got to. So we were getting. There was a time we were in in um, uh, Mercer, Delaware, the range, Mercer County range, up by the Delaware. Six inches of snow. We're having a good time shooting. I get a phone call. We got a wire takedown. Big job. Can you bring the team back? Six hours into it, we're like, it's cold. We're doing our thing. A bunch of a farting guys in a big truck <laughs> heading back, rushing back to go. Bunch of thick guys on high protein diets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a great time. Perfect, right? Yeah. You know, about a bunch of Peter Griffin. You know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and uh, we get there to hand us the packets. We got to whack this out, this Did out. Did you develop the the strategies, or were they handed to you? Oh, uh, uh, any of the wire stuff. It was already done, and then we'd have to put the plan in place. Mm-hmm. Like they'd have their intel, and they'd have their search warrant. Here's here's a target, but then we had to scramble like. Some of these jobs are like an hour. We're all going to call green light in an hour. Like, we just got here. Yeah. So we're scrambling. Because normally, if it was a drug job, gun job, like, we'd come in at 2 in the morning. That's some things people right there don't know. We'd come in like 2, 3 in the morning. The leaders would come in. We'd have, like, the, the narcotics guys would come in, give us the intel. We'd draft up the plan. And by the time the guy, we tell the guys 0500, sitting down in a chair, the plan was ready there. So we put up the tactical plan. We'd have everything ready to go. So hours ahead of schedule would be in that. But these wires, they just call us. Oh, you got to go. And we're rushing back, put, you know, hoodies off, throwing gear on, scrambling around. We didn't have all the best equipment, but we were building it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we were just, we were just doing a lot of work. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until uh, maybe like 20, well, after the shooting with uh, my friend Dave uh, in 2011, 2012, 13, that's when the no knock search warrant thing started getting scrutinized and yeah. things started changing. So things started slowing down. And that was kind of my all right, my leadership role from the team because I was one of those guys, like I want to be on the team, but I wanted to build a team with the other guys helping me making leaders out of everybody. So next man up. So fourth, we used to teach yep. in class. The fourth of July weekend, you got 20 guys. Fourth of July weekend, half the team is gone. Next man up. And that, or, if, or if a guy goes down, yeah, your leader goes, goes down. down. Yeah, that's redundancy. Yeah, so we we prepared all our guys and gals to be ready. So this guy can breach. You're the main guy. If you're gone, I could breach, or you could breach, and that's the way it was. And we just cross trained everybody, even though certain guys were assigned to that position, right? We were cross, yeah. but everyone was cross trained. Um, but then when that stuff started coming out, um, I was in. I worked in the uh, narcotics task force for a bunch of years, undercover stuff with the, the county so we were doing a ton of jobs like plain clothes i mean it was like okay corral out there we were just hey go ahead my mom with 10 hey joey hey got a bunch of houses you got hit like and he's handing me napkins like this is our ops plan they're doing they're yeah. doing this yeah, yeah exactly yeah, like, like i'd be in monroe and then you got to go up to newark to follow this guy with a million dollars of cash you got to do and we were just hitting places but it was like it was like the wild wild west like we were just throwing people like what the hell is going on so we had to, they brought me in to train the county narco guys how to do like efficient work. Yeah. Like you can't take a guy who's in a wheelchair and launch him <laughs> like to a table. Like that's what was going on. Um, but then once I got out of the county stuff, it was funny because sidebar, the chief had called me in. He said, you know, and me and the chief were really good friends. He's like, you know, you're getting a lot of good letters from the prosecutor. They're loving you there. You know, he goes, matter of fact, they want to keep you here for another two years. And I'm like, and I should have said, oh, it sucked. But I was having such a good time. I'm like, chief, honestly, um, if I could finish my career there, you know, I represent Piscataway, I'd do it. Boy. Then the next day, the blue slip came out, <laughs> back on the road. You're done. <laughs> and he, I come in and say, yo, Kevin, what's up? He's like, I can't lose one of my best cops. Yeah. Like, you know, because he thought they were going to suck me in to go there. Yeah. And then that's when things started slowing down. Um, plus the business, because I started the business in 20, 2002. And then we really would just... Oh, you were doing both at the same yeah, time. Yeah. yeah, That's a lot of work, bro. Yeah. 2002, I started it, and then the towers came... Uh, 2001, I had the plan. And we're talking about Team APC. Team APC, yeah. And when, when you trained our SWAT team in Lyndhurst, yeah. you were still working. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, when you just retired fairly 2020, recently. 2020, 2020, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like... So April of, of 2021, I was in Mex- New Mexico with bomb school. Tom Clancy was there giving a the, the guest speaker. That's and he, cool. And he was talking about... The towers, like he was talking about, the, the explosion happened in '93, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm like, I start writing up my plan how to get in, into the business of training because I was going to all these classes, and slowly there were a lot of guys like from Surefire, and a lot of these dudes like they were good dudes, but some of these guys were clowns. And I remember the one dude in at the Counterterrorism Symposium in New York, 
he was doing a demo, so he called me up because I was bigger, and he's like, "Hey, big guy, come up here." So he, he showed me this technique with the flashlight, and you, you, you know, you do a demo. So he takes me to the ground, and he's crank, he's cranking on me, right? So I'm like, oh, you know, like that. And he, he's like, hey, I can sit on this guy all day. And I was like, what the? So I, I hip toe, I basically roll my, my hips and I just flip them over and I jump on top of them, about to pound them. I'm like, and that was like my spark of like, I'm going to go out there and train these, these cops. Because you see, and I, you see that in every academy where you get the, the guy who, who wants to crank on the new guys. Yeah. And, you know, you get, you take a guy, uh, um, you know, you talked about jujitsu. You take a guy who knows jujitsu fairly well. Like, yeah. I don't know if you're a big subscriber to, to Jocko Willing. So yeah, jo yeah. Jo Jocko believes that every cop should be a purple belt. And he's right. Yeah. And he's right. Not to say that you're going to go hands-on with people, but it's more about the confidence. Yeah. It's like, I know. You, you might not have to use it, but I know that I can do this at any time I want. I yeah. can take you down. I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah. And um, that's why, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that cops should be – Jiu-jitsu yeah. practitioners. Oh, yeah. Number one, it's it, there's no better physical fitness in the world, in my opinion. Yeah. None. No, I doubt. But um, so you saw those holes in the training programs. Yeah. And you're like, well, I can do that a little bit better. Yeah. And that's why you started Team a APC. And yeah. Where, where, first of all, where did that name come from? Well, what happened was um, how, the, how the vision came when I saw it, like going back to what you said, all this nonsense of I was seeing all these holes. But then I was training our team. I would train with – our team would train with like Somerset County's team at the time, Hunter and County's team. So we were training with other people and I'd, or I'd teach in service at the Academy for teams and guys came to me and they're like, man, you should really go mainstream the way you you teach, bro. Like, you know, cause my intensity, you know, I'm yeah. at a hundred miles an hour and, you know, it tear <clears> you up. <throat> was that Hicks and Gracie's line? Cook your opponent in slow burn. That's who, <laughs> who I was. I was just like, just cook you. Right. So, so what happened was me, a retired sergeant from my department and a firefighter friend, family friend of ours, they said, let's do a consulting company. So, you know, we were trying to come up with names. And the official name is Awareness Protective Consultants. But the, why we did it was because we didn't want to just attack the police side of the house. We knew if we went to corporate, you know, we didn't want some some sling blade name, something <laughs> to scare. Because that's what happened. You go to corporate and they, they see yeah. this scary name. Like, oh, you guys are killers. So it just came up with that. And um, as Awareness Protective con Consultants, I changed it to, you know, added to doing business as Team APC. Basically, that's what it stands for. And it, it was like our, our cadre of uh, loyal trainer consultants. That's where it came from. You know, I just wanted to make it shorter, you know. And you've done a lot of business at Team APC over the course of 21 years. Yeah. You know, you are almost, you're almost a consultant as long as you were a cop. Which is, oh, which is crazy. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, and I tell guys all the time. Like, it, I was flying, we started flying overseas, and we started flying, you know, out to Asia, South America, Africa. Like, we we're training, you know, California, any you name it. We were going Singapore, and um, and I'd fly back home. You know, taking time off, working on my schedule, and then go right to work. Like, I'd get home on a red eye, go to sleep for three hours, four hours, and then I go right to work and four days, lock them up, and then like two o'clock in the morning, go home, get to sleep, and then maybe a SWAT school with these guys. You know, I'd be. Six o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, training SWAT and just zero sleep and just, you know, just just knew what it was. But I loved it, you know. I just I still love it, you know. I just but I loved it. Um, you, you, have you, to, can, you, you have can to tell by it. the way he talks how how yeah. into it is. You yeah. get to see him when he's training you. Dog. You have he's, to love it in order to do what and to do it the way you're doing it and yeah. to be successful. There's yeah. got to be a little bit of love. And I imagine when that love dissipates is when you start to pull back or are you trying to create that ideal team that you said before where you're creating a bunch of leaders so one day you can pull back yeah I, I'm, and i'm trying and and the, the tough part is is egos like mm. that's this business of like you know you see a lot of there's a, you know there's a lot of training companies out there and i've learned there's companies that annoyed me because i know a lot of the thing is being in this business so long you know even the background of every single person in the, like i know all these companies, I know everyone who's doing it, and I know the background more than they think I know. But I'm starting to see, like, you know, I'm glad that they're doing it, and I'm glad they're doing this. Or some of these companies, they came in high rev, running their mouths, you know. And again, we didn't have social media when I started, so that's why we're like, you know, we're just, we, we just keep things low key, but like we're slowly blossoming, I guess. But then, like, I start seeing these other companies, and I see, yeah, they're right. Their mission is right to try to help cops be better, you know what I mean? So I bring guys in a good small cadre of people, but what happens is, um, you know, some 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 the past guys they just got burnt out. Some guys they realize like the taxing of traveling, you know, just kind of 
And then someone would just like, well, you know, I went to this class, we did this. I said, I really don't care. Like, I don't, I don't care about the other class. Like, what we teach is our stuff. And at the end of the day, the new mantra for me is like, as the new people are coming on, I'm trying to build them and say, listen, guys, we are doing teaching cops back to basics. Basic fundamentals. I don't care if it's SWAT. I don't care if it's rifle instructor. I don't care if it's shield. They got to get active shooter. There's too much fancy stuff going on out here between all this military training, this stuff, all this wizardry stuff. And and you guys don't understand is that we, we got to train people to go back and train people with limited hours. So when it comes to a class for five days as an instructor or three days, they're not going back to the department. They're going to get three days to teach their entire department. They got to lucky if they get four hours for each shift, you know, and separated. And you got to rush, you got to cram all this knowledge. And we try to tell guys, teach your officers the basics. If they master the basics, the advanced stuff will be better. And that's what I'm trying to do with our team. Just a, a good collective group of guys where there's certain things I sit back on now. I mean, I got a guy, John Zamrock, yeah. the former state range master. You probably remember when he was on that's team. What, that's what he, I was talking about before, Zamrock. Zamrock. He's got six, 76 years old. He's still teaching. He wrote all the uh, weapon programs for the state of New Jersey. He was the guy. He saw how bad the training was, and that's how I really became inspired because I went to his subgun class in 99, and I watched this, this man teach. And he, I just stood there and watched him. I'm like, holy crap, this guy's amazing. And we got connected like that. And from the, him, from 2000, 2000, I would go down to the Division of Criminal Justice. I would train him, help him teach. And it was funny because... Umpteen instructors would be there, only like four or five out of like say 12 instructors. We'd be like watching the students, squatting next to them, making sure to fix their mistakes. And the other guys would just stand in their po- hands in their pockets. And I'm like, and John would say, he goes, I'm so glad we got guys like you. And then when he left DCJ, because Christy, at the time, Christy Regime, fun fact, Christy Regime wanted to lessen the hours of required training for police officers for range, use of force. And he had this big meeting, and this big Vietnam vet, you know, six foot whatever, six foot eight guy, slams his fist on the table, and he's like, this is the problem. You people who don't know anything about police work, you're going to get these cops killed. And, oh, no, no, we understand, John, you know, police training commission. And all of a sudden, as soon as he walked out the door, armed escort, walked him out, said, oh, Vietnam vet, you got to go. And the the first person he called besides his wife was he called me, Jose, I'm done with DCJ, coming on board. (laughs) So he's been like, you know, he's still teaching he still loves cops. He has family as cops. Um, but how do you how do you avoid getting burnt out? Like that that you you held held this business this high octane business for right. so long. Right. Burnout is inevitable. Yeah. But how do you go? How do you stop that? And this is sort of a lesson to people starting their own business, no matter whether it's a podcast or whether it's Team APC. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, from all the business models and stuff, and, and the studying I've done and learned, um, I, I just. I, I tell I tell my wife like I see John so John Zanruck seventy six, so I'm like how do I, how can I burn out if I see a guy like that, who cares? He'd be calling you a pussy. You know, and, <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> who are you? Uh? And, and then and then there was a point not too long ago, being honest too, right? That, you know, some of the the, the new new style of policing and the way some of the cops' attitudes and the entitlement stuff, you know, and it, again a lot of it's no fault of these young kids, it's just what what they're taught. You know, I guess. And I always said, here's my... And how they're taught in right. the police academy. And I always said... Kinder, gentler right. police academy now. When the academies, of most of these academies, when they start going to the colleges, especially, when they start moving from their own sanctum, sanctum place there to the colleges, I remember telling Somerset, I'm like, this is not going to be good. He goes, what do you mean? You know, college educated, I said, college educated is fine, but we go to this college, you're going to have these recruits mixed in with civilians. It's just going to be a bad mesh. No, they're going to build their own place. And I'm like, I'm like, Dr. Dr. Fles, I'm telling you, it's not going to be good. And you saw the quality changing. Like you started seeing people getting butt hurt. Like I couldn't yell like I used to. I couldn't, you couldn't curse, you know, you couldn't motivate them, you know. And if you insulted their intelligence, you know, uh, on like simple questions that recruit, like yell at them. Like I remember these three guys, where are you from? City of so-and-so, sir. You know, they're doing PT. They could barely do push-ups. I'm saying to myself, how does a man not be able to do push-ups? Because police work unfortunately, in general, has become more of a business. The salaries got super high. Yeah. When all of us started, you guys started before me. When we started, salaries, yeah, you made okay. You did all right. Yeah. 24000 my first year. My first year was thirty-three-five. 
All right, you did okay. It was a living. You're never going to get rich by it. But some of these salaries are so high. And then the road jobs, and then yeah. all the cops that all they think about is road jobs. Yeah. You take away the guys who just love to be civil servants. Yeah. You really yeah. do. They just, they have that, like you, I can tell by your passion, the way you speak about it, that you have this, this love for this. And I think, I think that's slowly going away and it's starting yeah. to become, police work is not a business. I yeah. hate to yeah. tell everybody. Yeah. It's not, it's a calling. It's, it's a, it's a feeling. You, you got to be cut out for it. It yeah. doesn't have to be yeah. cut out for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, yeah. You yeah. have to, you have to live and breathe this job every day in order to be effective. Yeah. I mean, my son, when he started, he same footsteps. He, he uh, started in Somerset County Jail. I said, just get your foot in the door. And then we started doing a civil service. And then he, sheriff's called him, Middlesex. And he had to go through the academy again. I said, I did the same thing. I went through Marine Corps boot camp, Corrections Academy, and now this. I said, it's going to make you a better person. And um, and it was a point, uh, I was saying before, it was a point not too long ago, I was actually feeling a burnout. Like I was getting to that point, like I'm getting tired of listening to these guys whine and complain. Because, listen, our training... There's dudes that friends with, like you know, that are on Instagram, and and they they've been they've been to a couple of our trainings, and like we you know we humble you. We're not we're not here to give you anything erotic or exotic, but we're here to humble you, and you know we want you to make mistakes. We're gonna expose everything you exactly. do that's so weak on you, but then we're gonna build you back up, and and you know we yeah. know that, right? Um, and I started seeing like a lot of these guys coming in, like they they, they come in. I use a phrase called swag goo. This is the new thing, right? So my buddy, uh, one of our instructors, Vinny Mayo, he he's probably listened to this when it goes live. Like, he goes, "What do you call Swagoo?" I said, "I'm seeing these guys and gals show up with all this cool gear, right? Look like something out of Catalog Commando." Yeah. And then uh, it's all swag. And then when they get on the range or to get on the, we, t- we fight with them on with their gear on, and all of a sudden sh- shit's falling off them, and they're just shit's just falling apart. It it call it becomes gooey. You're a gooey mess. Hence swag goo. So if you're gonna show up here with swag, you better be able to know how to use the swag. Otherwise, we're gonna turn you into swag goo, and and that's what's happening. So there was a time where I was just getting so tired, like between the cops and emails and com- complaining about this and, and always on their phones. And then at one point, like I I, t- I told my wife, like God, I could just open up that wave runner shop. Like I was like I was planning on moving to Anna Maria and just right before the COVID, I was gonna retire. But then all of a sudden, like I watched like on Patrol Live or Live PD at the time, and then I see a cop getting killed, and I'm like, this shouldn't happen. This should not happen. And then I'm like, and then all of a sudden my son got the call, and that's where I got resparked. You got rejuvenated. Um, big time. Like. A lot of vested interest now. I'm just like, it's, so that's what got me. I was almost burnt. I was feeling that burnout. Like maybe I could do something else. Maybe put in, you know, I could, I could have gotten a full-time job somewhere else, but I've been doing it so long and, and people just keep calling. Just when you think, okay, it's time to go, you know, then your, your kid is in it and then you start seeing cops getting killed. Um, and I'm a big proponent of, uh, for my background. I was not one who wanted to be friends with a lot of cops in my department. And any cop who knows, knows me, they would tell me, they would tell you. He was like, I, I would tell people in the academy, if you can count, depending on the size of your department, if you can count friends on one hand from who you associate with at work, you're doing something right. But if you want to be friends with everybody in that place and be liked, you're fooling yourself. I said, this is a business for, in a sense of you're here to serve the community first. And people would be like, oh, you're preaching. I'm not preaching. I'm saying I wanted to be a cop as a young kid, and when I walk into a house and see a young boy blows his head off in front of his parents because the father, you ain't got the balls to do it, and the kid shoots himself in the head, and we show up there, and the father's just kind of like, whatever, you know? Yeah. And that's that's the stuff that gets me like, oh, you know I mean? How do we fix that, you know? Well, that's the whole thing. It's how do you fix it? All right. Now, where can our audience find you and Team APC? Well, you can find me on... Uh, Instagram, right? Jose Medina APC or Team APC 360. Which uh, I just realized you didn't tell me that there's there. I know you're on Instagram, but you didn't tell me there's also Team APC version of it. Yeah. I just found that right. by yeah. accident. Yeah, because that's my, my, my Enigma page is the whole Jose Medina APC, um, which I go up and down in different directions. But then Team APC is the actual business thing that we're, uh, that we keep that exclusive to the training or we put videos like you guys do of situations that have happened. Um, 
And then um, our our videos are a little different these days. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. Usually us fucking around or something. Yeah, but you guys, are, but you guys, are, you're still sending a message. You know what I mean? Like part of the repair. You told me how to refix this. Like yeah, you guys it's, are. It's what it's about. Yeah, it's what it's about. You take care of their bodies. We t- we'll we'll handle yeah. a little bit. Like of we say, yeah. it. <laughs> we're not broken, but we're pretty fucking dented. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, blemishes. So we're coming to the end of this right. thing here. And I try to end it. You went through a lot of different suffering in building this, this something to make the world a better place. Right. Like that's honestly what I be, believe by by sending officers out on the road who are better trained, more confident. And when you're better trained, you're more confident. Right. But you put in a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, tears, and suffering. Right. What do you think it's taught you? Well, it's definitely taught me uh, to be always be extremely humble. Like, I'm, you know, even being retired, I'm still in the game. Um, but just when I think that um, I have the answers to a lot of things and I see something bad happen, um, I humble myself to the fact that, like, I don't know everything still, but um, it helps me to, to create something. How do we make this training better to help these guys and gals? You know, I mean, I guess that's really all I can say. Like, I, I, I learn from just seeing what's happening from the cops that stop by my house still to tell me the stories of what's going on. Um, you know, the, the captains and leaders that are leaving disgusted, you know, but then I humble myself to the fact that, you know what, I'm glad I did what I did 20 year, 21 years ago because someone told me in the PD, you're never going to make it. Like, and I said, I'm Th- there's do your it. motivation right there. That was it. You know, how are you going to run the team? How are you going to, and I did it and I did it and I, I, you know, basically humble myself to the fact that, you know, I don't know everything, but I know enough that I can at least, as, as Kevin said, leave these guys and gals in a better place. And I tell them, go to other training. I think that's a big thing. Go to other training. Be like I was. Like, we're not the end all game here. Go to other training and learn from everybody. And you have to master your craft because at the end of the day, out there in the streets, the bullets have the right of way. And, you know, we talk about go home to family, but humble yourself to the fact that, you know, you're going to make mistakes, but fail forward. That's because that's what I did. You know, when I lost my best friend in the shootout, um, I made a lot of mistakes, I, I, things I could have done better to, to keep him alive. But um, just try to humble myself, you know, and and at the end of the day, like, you know, I, lo- I almost lost my family numerous times to, you know, just stupid things I've done and, you know, my alpha male thing. But I've learned more as I get older. It's a true. Like you, as you older, older, you get wiser, and you, if you can humble yourself to the mistakes you make, at the same time, this is the successes that you achieve. Um, you know, I could rest my head on the pillow, and you know, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. You know. You know, I I just gotta say, I want to I want to first of all, I want to thank you for coming in here. Um, I mean, it, like it like I said, it's an honor for for me and Kevin to have someone of of your stature in here. Take that lightly. Um, it's an honor for him. He says that he he. It's an honor for him to sit next to me. <laughs> no, I have to I have to say that you're my partner. But no, H- Jose and his team came down and trained our SWAT team, and I got to tell you, these guys are a real deal. It's it's guys like him that taught me what professionalism is all about. I appreciate it, and I also uh, show him this too. Oh, uh, so Jose was kind enough to give us. Now I'm not wearing. My, I know it says Team APC, but I can't read what the rest of it says. Drop off these nice. Uh, Challenge coins, which you know we display, we get a, we get a fair amount of challenge coins. We're from gonna have people. to buy a new case soon. Yeah, and um, we're always very grateful. We're very Thank grateful you. that there's people out there like you still working on the second, the next generation. Thank you. Right. What it says real quick is, if you want peace, prepare for war. That's true. You know, that's um, you know what, what was it? You'd rather be a, a a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. That's it. I salute you. Thank you guys. <laughs> And that's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast. As always, let's think about all the stuff that we learned here. It's inspirational watching somebody grow up and make their childhood dream come true. You rise to the position that you were meant to be. A lot of work goes into looking professional. Holes are actually opportunities. Fail forward. But most importantly, it's not erotic. It's not exotic. It's just passion.
And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of SWAT with Jose Medina. And go to popple.com, put in the code TSP20 for a digital business card. Don't forget, all of our episodes come out on Sundays on audio format. You can listen to the complete episode before you watch on Monday on YouTube. Don't forget to follow us on all social media. That's LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Clapper. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And of course, follow the Suffering Podcast. And we'll see you on the next episode. 